Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless jesus said as a sign of his coming and the end of the age there would be an increase in deception false christ who will deceive many wars and rumors of wars nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom famines pestilences earthquakes christian persecution apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. John 15, 18 through 20. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. A surge of violence against Christians has flared up in India where millions believe the country belongs to Hindus. Many think all other religions must be eliminated from society. Human rights groups accuse India's prime minister of supporting this very extremist view and several states have enacted laws to punish non-Hindus. At 16 years old, Paul was instructed to target Christians by the Rastriya Swayam Savak Sangh, or RSS, a radical Hindu paramilitary organization. Since I was a Hindu and part of the RSS, I became a staunch follower of their Hindu principles, and because of that, killing Christians and pastors became my goal. We've concealed Paul's identity for safety. He says the RSS singles out Christians because so many Hindus in India are abandoning their faith to follow Jesus Christ. One of the group's early founders referred to Christians as anti-national and hostile and should be treated as such. RSS members seen here often combine religious Hindu education with self-defense classes and exercises. They told us Christianity doesn't belong to a country because they are converting people. Therefore, we have to attack pastors and demolish their churches so that our country will remain a Hindu country. Hindus make up just under 80% of India's population. Muslims are at 14%. Christianity is India's third largest religion with about 26 million followers or about 2.3% of the population. And their numbers are steadily growing. Determined to stop the growth, Paul thought he had his chance when a pastor visited his hostel. Instead, the encounter changed his life when the pastor shared the gospel with him. My heart was breaking when I heard that Jesus Christ's blood was sacrificed for me, that Jesus Christ loved me and he gave his blood for my sins. I dedicated myself to Christ right there and then. Paul now serves as a traveling pastor in remote areas of India's Karnataka state often referred to as a graveyard of pastors because of the intense persecution Christians face here. His church is repeatedly attacked by RSS gangs. He's been put in prison for preaching, yet it hasn't stopped his ministry. Even in jail, I felt God's love, even though I received the beatings. I was rejoicing, and because of that, I am grateful to God. India, with its 1.4 billion people, is the world's largest democracy. However, human rights and religious freedom advocates say democracy has been in retreat ever since the Hindu-led BJP government and its leader, Narendra Modi, took power in 2014. It's really the most sophisticated uh, government as far as restricting religious freedoms uh, outside of China. Dr. David Curry is a former member of the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom, USCIRF, has documented an unprecedented uptick in violence against Christians under Modi's rule. 
the majority of attacks carried out by RSS and other Hindu extremist groups with ties to the Prime Minister's political party. Modi is accused of fanning the flames of Hindutva, a radical ideology that teaches only Hindus are true Indians. They have a goal to push Christianity out of India. They see India as the holy land of Hinduism, and they intend to force that to happen. That includes passing laws that criminalize religious conversions. Last September, Karnataka became the 10th Indian state to pass these so-called anti-conversion laws, and with it carrying a three to five year prison term for anyone found guilty of illegally converting people to Christianity. Ever since this anti-conversion law was passed, the authorities claim that we are forcibly converting people. Joseph pastors in different cities and villages in Karnataka. We've taken similar precautions to protect his safety. He says RSS and other right-wing Hindu groups accuse him of converting Hindus by offering them money or other forms of bribes. He denies those charges. When we started the ministry 35 years ago, we didn't have so many problems. Those days, we had religious freedom, but now we can't even talk, can't even give out a pamphlet, can't do anything. That's the situation that we find ourselves in today. Everyone has to run their churches with fear. Like Pastor Paul, Joseph too has endured the wrath of Hindu radicals. They've damaged my bicycle, set Bibles on fire and burnt it. Come into our church during service and beat people up. The police have come to my house several times. I've been taken to the police station and repeatedly accused of forcing people to convert. They never have any evidence. Twelve of India's 28 states, most of them ruled by Modi's BJP party, now have laws regulating religious conversions. These states have also witnessed a surge in mob violence against Indian Christians. It is amazing how Christians are standing firm in their faith. Don Shank heads up an organization that's been sharing the gospel primarily through Christian radio broadcasts in India since 1978. His group has documented cases where Hindu extremists have discriminated against new Christian converts. Authorities, especially at the village level, do little to nothing to protect the vulnerable believers. It is amazing the number of people who are being banned from going to the village well, not allowed to purchase foods at the market, being chased out from being ostracized from family and community to actually being beaten, being killed, having their property destroyed. Although the constitution gives Christians the right to preach, Shank says the church in India must still be careful. Pray for the believers to stand firm in their faith and pray for those who are doing the persecution that their hearts will be changed, because we have seen that happen. A village priest threatened to smash a radio that somebody was using for outreach, but as he made those threats, he also came close and listened to the radio, and he himself embraced Jesus Christ as his Savior. Remember to pray for our persecuted brothers and sisters in Christ. Remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. Hebrews 13.3 1 Corinthians 12, 26. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. The Christian persecution the church is suffering right now, awful as it is, will only get worse. The Bible tells us in the last days, right before Jesus returns, the greatest political leader in the history of mankind will take the world stage. He will launch a military campaign that will result in his acquiring authority over all peoples of the earth as we read in Revelation 13, 7 and 8. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. His empire will be the most extensive in all of history, encompassing the entire world, and his rule will be the most demonic the world has ever experienced. He will appear to be the savior of the world, but as he consolidates his power, his true nature will be revealed. He will emerge as a Satan-possessed, an empowered person who hates God and is determined to annihilate Christianity. His method of eliminating Christians will be by beheading as we read in Revelation 24. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image 
and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. For this reason, he is identified in Scripture as the Antichrist as we read in 1 John 2.18. Little children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. 1 Corinthians 16.13 Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. In the last days, the prophet Zechariah tells us Israel will be the focal point of world conflict and he gives a dire warning to the nations who would dare come against Jerusalem. Zechariah 12, 2 and 3 Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. All who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. This prophecy is unfolding right before our very eyes. Iranian proxies Hezbollah and Hamas continue to attack Israel. The IDF targeted Hezbollah launch sites in Lebanon after the terror group rained 30 to 40 rockets on Israel's Golan Heights, killing two civilians as they traveled in their car. The barrage came after an Israeli strike killed Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrallah's former bodyguard in Gaza City. The IDF is renewing assaults on areas reoccupied by Hamas and Islamic Jihad terrorists. Israeli troops found these terrorists operating out of schools, a medical clinic, and the Gaza City headquarters of the UN agency UNRWA. Israel's foreign minister speaking at the NATO summit in Washington had a warning for the world. We must stop Iran before it's too late. Tehran is backing both Hamas and Hezbollah. Defeating Hezbollah poses the greater challenge by far and puts Israel on the front lines of a potential global war. Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant reported the IDF achievements to the Knesset after nine months of fighting. We eliminated or wounded 60% of the Hamas terrorists. We disbanded the 24 battalions, or the vast majority of them. We've returned half of the hostages and we're determined to return the rest. Hamas fighters are moving from place to place inside Gaza, forcing the IDF to re-enter places like Gaza City while urging civilians to evacuate. We want to get civilians out of harm's way. We have no interest in harming civilians in Gaza City or anywhere else. On Israel's northern border, Hezbollah continues to fire drones, missiles and rockets into northern Israel. This week, Hezbollah released a video showing its surveillance of Israel's military sites in northern Israel, including Iron Dome installations. Over sensitive Israeli positions in the occupied Golan Heights. This is the second drone video released by Hezbollah, showcasing its ability to infiltrate airspace over Israeli positions and highlight potential targets. Intelligence bases, military camps and command headquarters are some of the locations pointed out. Hezbollah has hit the Israeli-occupied Golan Heights before, but the message here is to show its ability and send a warning to Israel. Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrallah says it will stop its attacks if Israel agrees to a ceasefire with Hamas, but with a condition. If the Israelis want to continue and attack southern Lebanon, then we will also defend Lebanon, south Lebanon, our people, and our dignity. After thousands of Hezbollah rockets and missiles, most of the communities next to the Lebanese border stand nearly empty. We're about 200 meters, maybe about 600 feet from the Lebanese border. We're in Kibbutz Malkia, once a thriving agricultural community, but now like dozens of other communities on the Israeli-Lebanese border, mainly deserted. And most of its residents scattered throughout all of Israel. We sat down with the Thai Croys, the head of Kibbutz Malkia, and the grandson of Holocaust survivors. We are standing in, in, with our back to the wall. For us, it's a war of uh, surviving. We have no other place. It's a small country. We, we cannot go to another place inside Israel or from outside Israel. So we have no choice. We have to fight for our lives. Croys warns his kibbutz and Israel stand on the front lines of a global war. It's not our personal war. Tomorrow it can happen everywhere. It means that if we will not stop this terror and these attacks in, in, in the Middle East, it can happen everywhere. All, all these uh, 
fundamentalistic organization that build themselves an army and they say we, are want, we want to conquer the world and make the world Muslim with power. It can happen in France, it can happen in the USA. We saw what happened in the universities in New York. At the NATO summit in Washington, Israel's foreign minister called on member states to take strong action against Iran, which sponsors both Hezbollah and Hamas. Israel Katz tweeted, Iran is a common threat to Israel, NATO and to Europe. We must stop Iran now before it's too late. As we continue to watch the Muslim world unite against Israel, the Bible tells us there are four possible prophecies on the verge of finding fulfillment. Isaiah 17, 1 and 14, the burden against Damascus. Behold, Damascus will cease from being a city, and it will be a ruinous heap. Then behold, at eventide, trouble, and before the morning he is no more. This is the portion of those who plunder us, and the lot of those who rob us. Isaiah 17, 9. In that day his strong cities will be as a forsaken bow, and an uppermost branch, which they left because of the children of Israel, and there will be desolation. Isaiah 17, 1 and 14 tell us Damascus will be destroyed in a single night. Verse 9 suggests it is the children of Israel who caused this desolation, possibly with a nuclear weapon. Jeremiah 49, 34 through 37. The word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah the prophet against Elam. In the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will break the bow of Elam, the foremost of their might. Against Elam I will bring the four winds from the four quarters of heaven and scatter them toward all those winds. There shall be no nations where the outcasts of Elam will not go. For I will cause Elam to be dismayed before their enemies and before those who seek their life. I will bring disaster upon them, my fierce anger, says the Lord, and I will send the sword after them until I have consumed them. In this prophecy, Jeremiah predicts that Iran will be struck at the foremost place of its might, which today could infer an attack upon its nuclear program. One of Iran's most strategic and vulnerable nuclear targets is Bashar nuclear reactor located in the heart of ancient Elam. Jeremiah says that Iran has fiercely angered the Lord, and that provokes the Lord to cause a severe disaster inside of Iran. Israel seeks to prevent Iran from becoming a nuclear nation. Perhaps this alludes to a nuclear disaster caused from a strike upon Iran's Boucher nuclear reactor. There's a prophecy written by Asaph the seer that many end time teachers believe has yet to find fulfillment. In this prophecy, a confederation of Muslim nations have taken crafty counsel against the Jewish people in Israel in order to destroy them as we read in Psalm 83, 1-8. Do not keep silent, O God. Do not hold your peace and do not be still, O God. For behold, your enemies make a tumult, and those who hate you have lifted up their head. They have taken crafty counsel against your people, and consulted together against your sheltered ones. They have said, Come, and let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be remembered no more. For they have consulted together with one consent. They form a confederacy against you. The tents of Edom and the Ishmaelites, Moab and the Hagrites, Gabal, Ammon, and Amalek, Philistia with the inhabitants of Tyre, Assyria also has joined with them. They have helped the children of Lot. Ezekiel 38, 1-9 The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, set your face toward Gog of the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him, and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and I will turn you about and put hooks into your jaws, and I will bring you out and all your army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed in full armor, a great host, all of them with buckler and shield, wielding swords. Persia, Cush, and Put are with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Gomer and all his hordes, Beth Garma from the uttermost parts of the north with all his hordes, many peoples are with you. Be ready and keep ready, you and all your hosts that are assembled about you, and be a guard for them. After many days you will be mustered. In the latter years you will go against the land that is restored from war, the land whose people were gathered from many peoples upon the mountains of Israel which had been a continual waste. Its people were brought out from the peoples and now dwell securely, all of them. You will advance, coming on like a storm. You will be like a cloud covering the land, you and all your hordes, and many peoples with you. These are the modern day nations listed in Ezekiel 38 and 39 who will be mustered in the latter years to attack Israel. Russia, Iran, Turkey, Libya, 
Sudan, and Ethiopia. God tells us exactly what will happen to Iran, Russia, Turkey, and the many peoples with you when they attack Israel in Ezekiel 38, 18 through 23, and 39 to 7 and 8. And it will come to pass at the same time when God comes against the land of Israel, says the Lord God, that my fury will show in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath I have spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel, so that the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, the beasts of the field, all creeping things that creep on the earth, and all men who are on the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. The mountains shall be thrown down, the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. I will call for a sword against Gog throughout all my mountains, says the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother, and I will bring him into judgment with pestilence and bloodshed. I will rain down on him, on his troops, and on the many peoples who are with him, flooding rain, great hailstones, fire, and brimstone. Thus I will magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. And I will turn thee back, and leave but the sixth part of thee, and will cause thee to come up from the north parts, and will bring thee upon the mountains of Israel. So I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let them profane my holy name any more. Then the nation shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Surely it is coming, and it shall be done, says the Lord God. This is the day of which I have spoken. I've been informed by top-ranking military officials that Israel has been unable to launch even a single plane in defense. As I stand here, fighter planes are exploding in midair. They're crashing and falling to the ground without any explanation. And while no one can seem to give me any reason for why this is happening, I can tell you this. This all-out, unprecedented attempt to destroy Israel appears to be failing. God is the one who fights this battle for Israel. He does it for two reasons. To make his holy name known in the midst of his people Israel, that the nation shall know that he is the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Zechariah 2, 8, and 9. For thus says the Lord of hosts, He sent me after glory to the nations which plunder you. For he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. For surely I will shake my hand against them, and they shall become spoil for their servants. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. Israel is precious to Almighty God, the apple of his eye. He is simply saying, You touch my chosen nation Israel, you poke me in the eye. Is Vladimir Putin, the infamous Gog of Magog, that the prophet Ezekiel warned would come on the scene in the last days and lead a coalition of nations to destroy Israel? Or could Gog be Recep Tayyip Erdogan, another dictator, who is fast gaining power and dominance in the Middle East? Biblical scholars can't agree if the prophet Ezekiel was talking about a last day's assault on Israel being led by Russia or Turkey. Many popular Bible teachers claim that Gog will come from Russia, while others claim that Ezekiel's prophecy actually points to Turkey. Whether Gog is from Russia or Turkey, both nations are presently being led by undisputed dictators who could each very easily fit the Gog profile. As a sign of his coming and the end of the age, Jesus declares, And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet, for a nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. On NATO and EU's most eastern frontier, tensions are mounting. As a joint military exercise between China and Belarus begins near the city of Brest, only a few kilometers from the Polish border. Events taking place in the world are alarming. The situation is uneasy. Therefore, we are going to practice new forms and methods of performing tactical tasks. Poland denounced the provocative drills by Russia's allies, promising reinforced military presence at the border, with an additional 2,000 armed forces and thousands of readily mobilized reservists. The NATO summit wrapping up in D.C. today with President Biden set to hold a high-stakes solo press conference. The uh, alliance released its summit declaration yesterday, slamming China over its support for Russia, calling it, quote, a decisive enabler of Russia's war in Ukraine. The declaration also calling for Beijing to cease all material support to Moscow's war effort, saying, quote, the PRC cannot enable the largest war in Europe in recent history without this negatively impacting its interests and reputation. China is pushing back on that declaration this morning, saying, quote, this comes with malicious intent, unquote. Joining me now is Gatestone Institute senior fellow, author of The Coming Collapse of China and China is Going to War, Gordon Chang. Your reaction to this NATO declaration? Well, I think the declaration certainly is descriptive because apart from supplying troops, China's support for Russia is all in. And talking about Chinese troops, at this moment, 
Chinese troops and those from Belarus are now participating in joint exercises in Belarus, just three miles from the Polish border, a NATO member. Wow. And so clearly we've got to now start thinking about whether China will get involved in the Ukraine war in some way. You know, most people say, well, that's just impossible. But we've got to remember that China intervened in North Korea's side when North Korea was losing in 1950. The same thing could happen now. Well, it certainly feels like China has big plans. I mean, just 50,000. And Chinese nationals coming into America in the last year uh, raises a, a, an eyebrow. What are they planning? So where is this going? Remember that walk in the park that Joe Biden took with Xi Jinping uh, last year? I mean, the mental capacity issues had to be on full display there as well. How are our adversaries viewing this? Well, with regard to China, I mean, they think that they now have a window of opportunity. What really concerns me is that Xi Jinping has personal incentives now to go to war. We may not be able to deter this guy because he might be motivated solely by what's going on in the Chinese capital. Do you think the Chinese see the inevitability of a Trump presidency and that they are doing things like positioning troops in Belarus, moving their carriers in the Taiwan Straits, in the Philippines? Do you think they're doing that as a, a way to stage themselves for negotiating points against a, perhaps a more stronger president? Well, yeah, and they certainly see a closing window of opportunity, which closes on January 20, 2025. And so right now, at this moment, we don't have to speculate because China is engaging in extremely belligerent activities at Second Thomas Shoal and other features in the South China Sea. And those are flashpoints which are could lead, very well lead to war. Luke, 2125, and there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth distress of nations, with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. One of the many signs we are living in the last days, right before the return of Jesus Christ, is nations will be in a state of perplexity or uncertainty over what to do in a difficult situation. This is exactly what is happening in our world today. High tensions in Paris Sunday after France's national rally surged to a lead in the first round of legislative elections. Protesters set fires and launched fireworks to voice their opposition to the party, which now stands that much closer to a position of power in the government. A right-wing party scoring a very big win in parliamentary elections over the weekend in France. The populist national rally led by the outspoken Marine Le Pen coming in first with some 33 percent of the vote amid a big turnout. Their nationalist line hitting strong on immigration, crime, the cost of living, the European Union and globalism resonating with the French people. Government uprisings are now a daily occurrence in our world. People in just about every nation are protesting, rioting, and demanding their governments do a better job taking care of the people. A man, I believe, who is alive and well today will soon come on the world scene, seeming to have all the answers, and he will bring a false peace to the nations of the world. Three and a half years after this man comes on the world scene, his true intentions will become known. He will bring war the likes of this planet has never seen. And with war will come famine, pestilence, and death. The Bible refers to him as the Antichrist, and he will be welcomed by millions of those on earth not taken with the rapture. Unfortunately, his true identity will be known soon to those left behind that his true intentions are death, destruction, and control. What do we know about the Antichrist? The Antichrist has many names. The king of fierce countenance, the prince who is to come, the beast, the son of perdition, the worthless shepherd, the man of sin, the lawless one. The first sealed judgment in the book of Revelation is the releasing of the Antichrist upon the earth. Revelation 6, 1 and 2. Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him and he went out conquering and to conquer. The Antichrist will be evil, yet appear as a savior. He will be outspoken and have great speaking ability. He will have a fierce countenance. The Antichrist will be extremely proud. He will not desire women. He will be a military genius. The Antichrist will be mortally wounded. He will be indwelt by Satan. He will come from a revived Roman Empire. The Antichrist will control a one world government. He will control a one world religion. He will control a one world monetary system known as the mark of the beast. It is evident that planet Earth is in the time Jesus refers to as the birth pains. The world is seeing death, destruction, and despair at unprecedented levels. The events the world is suffering through right now, awful as they are, will only get worse. The Bible tells us in the last days, right before Jesus returns, there will be a time of severe distress this world has never seen or ever will see again, as we read in Matthew 24, 21. For then there will be great tribulation, just as it has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. 
This time of distress Jesus is referring to is called the seven year tribulation in which the inhabitants of planet earth who have rejected God and remain unrepentant in their sin will face his wrath. These terrible judgments are pictured as seven seals opened, seven trumpets blown, and seven bowls poured out. The first four of the seven seals are known as the four horsemen of the apocalypse. The book of Revelation tells us when Jesus breaks the first seal and the white horse rides, the Antichrist will be unleashed. When Jesus breaks the second seal and the red horse rides, war will be unleashed. When Jesus breaks the third seal and the black horse rides, famine will be unleashed. When Jesus breaks the fourth seal and the pale horse rides, death and Hades will be unleashed. The Bible tells us 25% of the population of the earth will be killed at this time, as we read in Revelation 6-8. So I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and the name of him who sat on it was death, and Hades followed with him. And power was given to them over a fourth of the earth, to kill with the sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. The population of the world is roughly 8 billion, meaning 2 billion people will die during this time. The remaining 17 judgments of God include devastating earthquakes, cosmic disturbances, scorching heat, meteors, 100-pound hailstones, volcanic eruptions, loathsome sores on those who take the mark of the beast, the seas, rivers, and springs of water turn to blood, demons torturing mankind, and a 200 million strong demonic army who will kill another third of mankind, bringing the total to 4 billion. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive, in faith, the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation. Repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church, you may be at work, you may be asleep, God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.